Transmitter device activating. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Earth 2 podcast, your weekly exploration of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters through the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. It's a little bit tenuous this week, if we're honest, <laughs> but it's a brilliant cover to the comic we're going to do this week. And it's kind of another universe, another dimension, and mm-hmm. another type of, you know, really, because I love this cover. I Is found it? a few foreign reprints of it, and I was like, can we just do this one? It looks kind of... And Pete was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so this week we're doing issue 213 of World's Finest Comics, published three days before... Paul McCartney's 30th birthday on the 15th of June, 1972. And Peter is going to tell you about this amazing cover. Yep, the top third of the cover is taken up with the world's finest logo. You've got Superman on the left. You've got the Atom, who's the guest star in this issue. This is the time when it's a Superman team-up book. Mm. He's on the right. We've got the new, all new DC Comics logo in the top left. Yay! With worlds above the DC and finest below the DC. All new stories. Now only 20 cents. Now only 20 cents. Five cents cheaper than it was, but you're getting a lot fewer pages for your buck. (laughs) But the main image in the cover, Superman is on the phone. Mm. He's looking absolutely shocked. He's using his vision powers to look into the wire that he's grasping in his hands. And he's saying, Adam, I can see you with my x-ray vision, but I can't help you. You're doomed. And there's a cutaway in the telephone wire and we can see the shape of Ray Palmer, the atom, trapped within the wire. Gasp. Gosh, indeed. I love this cover because it pops the the blue and reds of their costumes and the red of the logo against the yellow Mm -hmm. and then the yellow of Soup's sort of vision powers. It's it's all very coordinated. Yeah. No, I love it. Without further ado, we shall leap straight in. Our opening splash panel. It's almost a pink sky. There's a yellow-skinned man wearing a sort of green tunic, green boots. He has pale green hair. And he seems to be hurling Superman and the Atom off a rocky outcrop into some clouds. Gosh, there's a lot of text. The text says... It comes with the random ebb and flow of time. This genesis molecule which threatens the life of two universes comes to absorb all that grows, all that is... Prepare for alien danger and atomic hazard. Prepare for a world whose like you have never seen before. A world of strangeness and superstition as Superman and the Atom team up to combat peril Peril in in a a very very small place. place. Captions tell us that. Story by Elliot Magan. Art by Dick Dillon and Joe Giella. Yep, yep. We're in safe hands this week, listeners. Right. Our opening story page, page two. Ray Palmer in his white coat, in his laboratory, looking at his microscope and all that. Caption for the first panel says, Early one morning in the Ivy University laboratory of Ray Palmer, Associate Professor of Atomic Physics. Ray looks at his watch and thinks, Good Lord, almost eight o'clock. I've been staring at this lab culture all night, waiting for something to happen. I thought finally I'd isolated the gene factor, the peculiar quality in my makeup that safely allows me to shrink in size when I become the atom. He kind of rubs his eyes here. He's obviously very tired. And he looks back into the microscope and notices something. Huh? That thing's shrinking. And he seems to spill his cup of tea or coffee or whatever it is, drops it onto the floor as this is going on. Our angle sort of perspective changes. We look up at him from the floor as he looks into the microscope and thinks, If that culture gets down to a certain size without exploding, I'll have found what I'm looking for. It's shrinking too fast, getting too small to see with this microscope. The next panel is almost his point of view shot as he looks into the microscope and we can see like a burst of orange and blue energy going on. It's almost like whatever it is that Ray's looking at. It's very odd. He continues to think. Can't shrink myself and watch it as the atom because I might contaminate the slide. Wait a minute. I've got a friend who can watch it with his microscopic vision. In the final panel, page two, he picks up the telephone receiver and starts to dial, thinking... Maybe I shouldn't call Superman at this hour. He does have a busier schedule than I do. Oh, come on. Even a congressman has a busier schedule than a college professor. Lol. First caption then for the first panel of page three. Dialing the number of Clark Kent's apartment, the young scientist touches a special control on his belt. And he continues to think. But it won't just talk to Clark. I'll go see him. As the Adam. It's a great panel. See Ray activating his powers and shrinking down to the atom appearing in costume. The phone receiver is now down on the floor. You can see also next to it on the floor a metronome. Interesting. Panel two, the atom crosses to the metronome. 
We can hear the burring of the, the telephone signal coming out of the handset, and the atom is thinking. Soon as Clark answers the phone, I'll reduce myself in size and hop into this mouthpiece. And the sound waves from this metronome will propel me through the wire and out Clark's receiver. Fantastic. A slow dissolve then. Caption for panel three. Meanwhile, in the apartment at 344 Clinton Street in the city of Metropolis. Yes, we see a very suave looking Clark Kent wearing a purple dressing gown and a yellow scarf. He appears to be operating some kind of tape recording or sound system type device that seems to be attached to his wall. He's thinking, phew, I think he's finally finished practicing. Jangles Jones, the rock musician in the apartment upstairs, has been banging those drums all night. Sits down in panel four, we can see some oddly shaped musical notes mm. sort of surrounding him in the, in, the, in the atmosphere. Clark looking very teethy and scary, actually. Steeples his fingers and thinks, now I've got a chance to sit back and be plain ordinary Clark Kent and listen to my favourite music. The classic sonic flare patterns by the musicians of the planet Polaris 4. It's a great close-up of Clark in the final panel of page 3, running this page out, as he continues to think, can I help it if my tastes are a little exotic? And then there's a bring as his phone rings. Clark thinks, huh? And as we arrive at the top of page 4, we're back in the Atoms laboratory, we see the metronome ticking away, we hear Clark's voice from the receiver saying, hello? And the Atom thinks, Clark's home. So, bombs away, Dad! And he shrinks down further, leaps into the phone receiver. The captioning for the next couple of panels says, As the tiny titan uses his time-tested mode of telephonic travel, there is a small explosion in his lab, shattering his microscope and his hopes. Yes, very impressive, minimalist, concussive explosion from the microscope going up. Panel 3. And for an instant imperceptible to the human mind, the sound of a metronome hurls him through an electronic netherworld at telephonic speed. Yeah, we continue to hear the text of the metronome and it almost looks as though Ray is sort of swimming through a current here. It's very, very effective. We open up to a larger panel to round out page four, captioned, But in the next instant... The atom is hurtling towards a large, glowing burst of energy. There appear to be little waves and tendrils of paler energy light bursting from it, coiling around. And there's definitely a sense of the atom caught in a, in a stream of bubbles as he flies towards it, and he thinks, Usually my phone hopping is safer than a trip in the Jersey Turnpike. Better wake up now, because if I don't get away from that glowing thing that's over there, this tiny titan is in big trouble. Gosh, top of page five now, caption for the first panel. At that moment in Clark Kent's apartment... Yes, we see Clark answering his phone. He's saying, hello, hello. We can still see the music playing in the background. Clark thinks, ah, I hate it when the phone rings and no one. What's that strange ticking sound at the other end? Maybe I can trace the call with my telescopic, but he's interrupted by a cry from outside. Hey! Great Krypton, thinks Clark. What's going on out there? It sounds like a job for, and he drops his phone, you can see it on the counter on the inset panel, and then he's outside in his super suit, flying down towards some backed up traffic, and he continues his sentence out loud, for Superman! You can see lots of backed up traffic and some police officers investigating a green motor. One policeman is saying, Oh, what is this? Superman lands on the pavement beside the officers and he observes, It's chaos. Traffic tied up for blocks. One of the policemen says, Very observant, Superman. Come on, everybody. Back in the sidewalk. Try to deal with all the pedestrians or try to see what's going on. Superman says to the policeman, What's the cause of all of this? I don't know. Every bit of metal for three blocks around is charged with electricity. Yeah, they're not doing a great job of picturing that, it must be said, unless that last policeman exclaiming, ow, what is this, on that previous page was was all about. There's a long-haired chap standing with his girlfriend amongst the, the crowd who remarks at this point, man, it was wild, like my steering wheel just bit me or something. Don't go near a car. Donna, you listening? Soups takes to the air in the next panel, saying back to the policeman, have your men divert traffic around Clinton Street while I get something to ease the problem temporarily. And the policeman... Taking his hat off, seeing how bald he is. He looks like um, George from Seinfeld. He says, Divert, he says. I've been diverting. Easier said than done. And Soups thinks, well, certainly a testy fellow. And the long-haired chap is clicking his fingers in front of his girlfriend. She seems to be in a daze. He's saying, Donna? Donna? And Arrow leads us to the next panel on page six, which is captioned. Less than a second later, at a nearby art supply store. Yes, Soups flies in. We can see a sign on the wall that says Dylan and Giella Art Supplies. Mm. That's great, isn't it? Soups enters and says, 
I need a carton of quick-drying spray enamel. It's an emergency. And the first shop guy says, uh, Sure, Superman. Whatever you want. And the other assistant says, He's working for the city. Give him 10% off. Caption name for the final panel of page 6. Moments later. It's a cracking graphic image of Superman flying along between all the cars that are all stopped on the road. And as he does this, he's thinking, If I spray all the stopped cars with non-conducting enamel and harden it fast enough with heat vision, everyone can get out of the area so I can find the cause of the problem. And as he's flying along, it looks so he's spraying one set of cars on his left-hand side with yellow paint and the other side on his right-hand side with red paint. So hopefully the owners won't mind too much. <laughs> Uh, him doing this we arrive at the top of page seven and we can see him spraying the last of the cars and also we can see that he's directing some of the yellow paint at some of the nearby buildings as he's doing all this he's thinking better get all the metal doorknobs too so people can get into their homes and he stops and looks around in panel two page seven thinking there's something around here emitting a massive electrical field and tracing it is just a matter of finding where the charge is the strongest in the background we see the long-haired chap still trying to get his girlfriend to react and he's saying donna we can go back to my car now. Donna? Donna doesn't seem to be having it. A slow dissolve. Meanwhile, the atom and his problem. Yes, the atom is still caught in a stream of bubbles that's heading towards this big glowing burst of golden energy. And the atom is thinking, I'm obviously caught somewhere in a phone line between Clark's apartment and my lab. That big glowing mass over there is somehow drawing me toward it. Yes, we see in panel four that that's indeed what's happening. The atom does seem to be being drawn towards the golden energy. He gets a close-up in the final panel of page seven as he thinks, Yuck, that blob is absorbing everything in sight. Oh, I just want a nice warm bed. Better expand my body and try to get back into that electron flow through the wire. Because remember, he's been up all night, he's shattered. There's an inset panel in the first panel of page eight of the atom trying to activate his size control belt. And nothing seems to be happening. He thinks, What? That thing must be shorting up my size controls. Pull back to a wider shot. He seems to be hovering in front of a cluster of atoms in front of him. And he's thinking, The only thing that still works is my Justice League communicator. If I had a lot of good that does. At this size, the signal waves are too short for anyone to receive. And in panel two, he's still fiddling about with his technicals as he thinks, Hold it. My weight controls might be all right. If I can... And then suddenly he recoils, obviously in pain, and he has a sort of psychic yell as he cries. Ow! And he thinks... All of a sudden, the sky turned colours. Can't breathe. Feel like I'm being crushed. Yeah, and there's a sort of wave of blue and purple and green behind him, as opposed to the sort of more neutral green that had been behind him in the previous couple of panels. Again, this cluster of what looks like atoms in front of him. In the final panel of page eight, the burst of golden energy is visible again as the atom thinks oh back to normal strange i think the colors in this air have something to do with life support gosh you arrive at the top of page nine he continues to think but this is no time to be playing scientist that area over there looks a lot safer than this place does now if i can maneuver my weight right yeah and again he's looking at the cluster of atoms that it looks basically like a sort of sort of lump of blue balls and globes just stuck together, really, doesn't it? Modern art is rubbish. Yes. <laughs> Captioning for panel two of page nine. Increasing his weight, the mighty might flips toward the safety zone. Yeah, you can see him flipping backwards, head over heels almost, and the caption for panel three. And then abruptly decreases it. Again, he's hurtling towards this cluster of blue balls. Caption for panel four. Thus, with lessened weight, the atom swats himself like a bullet away from the glowing mass. Yes, and we see him hurtling away from it very clearly in this panel. In the final panel of page 9, the captioning continues... Toward something else. Yes, he's now hurtling towards the afore oft mentioned cluster of blue spheres. As he flies towards it, the atom is thinking... This figures to be a subatomic universe down here, where the normal laws of science don't seem to apply at all. Odd. It feels more comfortable as the atmosphere turns colours toward those of lower frequency, like red and orange. Yeah, and we should, we should say that over the last couple of panels of page nine, as he moves away from the golden energy, everything around him has turned an orangey red. So this is all very interesting. I hope Elliot Magan has thought this through. We arrive now at the top of page ten, and there's an insert panel of the atom, first of all. And we see him thinking... Rocketing headlong into a planet of a subatomic system with defective size controls... And I can't stop thinking like a scientist. Ray, don't go changing. We pull out to a wider shot here, and it seems like it's plummeting into a sort of valley. We can see weird sort of giant mushroom-type growths and 
other types of large green growth and weird rocky outcrops. It's all very Edgar Rice Burroughs, if you ask me. As he falls down towards it, the captioning continues. Shortly, the human atom reduces his weight further to float to the surface of something that is not really a planet, but a place. We're back to the Man of Steel, as the caption for the next panel says. As Superman ponders his own mystery. Yeah, we can see Soup's using his vision powers. Well, very helpfully, he tells us what he's doing as he thinks. The electrical field seems to be centred in that phone cable leading to my apartment building. Checking it out with all my supervisions, I can't find anything wrong with it. He flies back into his apartment in the next panel where the music is still playing. We can see a, a little burst of energy or a little glow or an indicator light or something on his phone receiver. As he arrives and Soup thinks, oh... Forgot I left my phone off the hook. Funny, that ticking is still... Obviously, maybe that's to tell us that he can, he's detecting the metronome. Picks up the receiver on the final panel of page 10 as he looks surprised and thinks, Hey, another odd sound I can barely make out. Almost like a... Better look into this. And we arrive at the top of page 11 now. The caption for the first panel there says... Pulling the radiator from the wall of his Clark Kent apartment. Now, listeners, bear with me. <laughs> if you have a copy of World's Finest 213 better have it open or if you've got that nice hardback that reprinted I'm not even sure if it's in that nice hardback that reprinted yeah, some on. of those stories Soups is pulling the radiator is obviously behind the wall and he looks like he's pulling it's like, it seems to be a kind of coiled element and he's basically pulling part of this element out of the wall thinking the sound waves are so small so faint I need some sort of super amplifier panel 2 page 11 he's coiling this around into a sort of loop, and he's thinking, the mysterious noise follows the same pattern as a jelly emergency signal. By remoulding this radiator into the snail shell shape of a cochlea, the part of the inner ear that translates vibrations into sound, then hooking it up to my stereo set, and that's what we see him doing. I might put that panel on the social so you can have a, you can see for yourself. And then he continues to think, the final panel, page 11, no, still can't quite make it out. Better get that radiator back into the wall before my landlord throws a fit. We can see the detail of the, the phone receiver attached to the to the coiled up piece of radiator element. Fascinating. Don't try this at home. Mm. Top of page 12 is captioned. After repairing the radiator, the man of steel streaks northward toward his arctic fortress of solitude. Yes, yes very moody shot of Superman flying through a dark and evening sky. There's a hint of an aurora borealis going on behind him as he approaches the... The fortress thinking, only thing left to do now is reduce myself in size and see what's causing the electrical field and that sound. In panel two, he's already exiting the fortress. We don't get to see inside the fortress. So they obviously saved some money building the set that week. Mm -hmm. He's flying away again, something under his arm. And he's thinking, with the help of this Kandorian shrinking ray. And the caption for the final panel of page 12. And in less than a moment, back in Metropolis. Superman has activated the shrinking ray. You see him reducing in size and then flying into the mouthpiece of the telephone. Gosh. Fantastic. A tiny caption says, continue on the second page following. Pass an advert for some soldier toys. And then at the top of page 13, the caption for the first panel reads, Meanwhile, the atom lands in this strange new place. Yes, the atom's standing. It looks like he's looking up at the sky, which is sort of pinkish red. And it's almost like the, the golden cluster of energy that we saw earlier on. It's almost like the sun. It's kind of hovering up near above him. And the atom thinks, Yes, the atmosphere is richer here. Huh? And he's distracted because a voice has spoken from off panel saying, You there! You from above! And we pull back for a wider shot as this figure says, Are you a demon or a god? And we see it's the guy from the opening splash panel. You can see that his skin is yellow as scales. He has green hair. Thick green eyebrows, a thick green moustache, pointy yellow ears, wearing a green sort of tunic and almost like a green sort of skirt effect, green boots, green sleeves, deep v-neck and almost a medallion. And behind them, three or four other figures, they look younger actually. Mm -hmm. They seem to be doing weird acrobatics. Some people swinging off some overhanging crops and some doing somersaults. Do you know what? He looks to me like, what if Jonathan Thingy, who played Dr. Smith in Lost in Space, Jonathan Harris? Harris, yes. What if he turned up in a late episode of the Time Tunnel playing an alien? Oh, yes. Yes, very much so. I can see that. He was in an episode of Land of the Giants, but I don't think they gave him such outlandish makeup. Basically, if you picture Jonathan Harris, listeners, painted yellow with a green wig, you'll do fine. The Atom looks up at this figure, because the Atom, we should point out, is not really regular size. It's like, as if, you know, 
He's like action figure size in comparison to what a normal adult, if you like. This man looms over him, and the Atom replies, Neither. I'm known as the Atom, and I'm a traveller. And he thinks. His words are like electrical impulses. I feel inside my brain. Yeah, because it looks so the Green Alien... His speech bubbles are sort of, they're tinted blue and there's a jagged edge to them. It's almost like his words are being transmitted rather than spoken. He gets a close-up in panel three as he says, I am called Dav Skiv, leader of a doomed race. Woe to the traveller who comes upon this place, for all are doomed by the absorber. In the final panel on page 13, he gestures towards the big burst of golden yellow energy that's in the sky above them. And for the benefit of our YouTube viewers... I'm gesturing to my right to my very impressive bookcases. The Atom thinks, This cat might talk funny, but he can sure make a guy feel insecure. And then the Atom replies to Dav Skiv, in the first panel of page 14, saying, I'm not in the habit of sitting around being doomed, Dav. What is this absorber thing? I will tell you, brash little being. And then Dav Skiv gets one of our patented head caption insert type things as he narrates, our world is maintained by the power from the flow of the globe through the skies. Power that keeps us alive. And we see very much like the droplets of the, the stream that the atoms seem to be flying and swimming through earlier on. We see them flying along. But this coagulation, this group of balls and spheres that we saw earlier on, is at the heart of it, surrounded by a little burst of energy. Dav's caption for the next panel. But a short time ago, the absorber appeared and began to grow by absorbing the power globes and whatever other matter there was. And we see the oft-mentioned now burst of golden energy, and it seems to be absorbing all of the platelets, if you like, for the stream that the atom was swimming through, and preventing them from reaching the cluster, which is what I refer to as their world from now on. Panel four, we can see some of Dav's fellow people, a couple of people down on the ground, obviously suffering in pain, one person with their hand up to their head, Dav's captioning narration continues. Already our civilization lies in ruin, our people dying off. Soon our world itself will be absorbed. Listen, you can feel the tremors even now. In the first panel of page 15, either Dav's leaning down towards the atom or the atom standing on Dav's hand, but the atom is contemplating what Dav has just been saying and he thinks, Those power globes must be the electrons rushing through the telephone wires on Earth. When there are a lot of electrons, the atmosphere turns red and supports life better. In panel two, the atom is looking up at the sky above him, and it's a whole rainbow of colours, basically, at this point, as he thinks. Amazing. A world whose universe is a telephone wire, and whose air and food are electrical currents through the wire. Blimey. Hope you're taking this all in, kids. A slow dissolve, caption for panel three. While the subsized Superman speeds through the telephone wire... Yep, it's a shot of Superman swimming, flying through the platelet stream, as it were. And he's spinning along, thinking, That signal is just ahead. From the part of the wire I traced that electrical disturbance. Oh no, it's a Genesis molecule! Final panel of page 15, he's beholding the golden energy burst in its full glory. We can see the little platelet nodules hovering around him, being absorbed. In the first panel of page 16, he flies up and away from it, thinking, That signal! It must be the Adams. Might have known he's the only one I know who runs around in telephone wires. He's obviously approached the cluster planet. Using his vision powers in panel 2, page 16, we can see the atom down on the ground. Soups is thinking, he must have been intercepted by the molecule. Don't know how he stayed in one piece until now. He doesn't know what danger he's in. He flies down towards the atom, alights beside him in the third panel, page 16, and the atom says, Superman, how did you get here? I heard your JLA signal. Oh, that. Guess I left it on by mistake. I'm tired. You look exhausted. Been up all night, watching a... Look, don't tell me your problems. You have to get out of here. I've seen these Genesis molecules before. Genesis molecule? You mean that absorber? I'm pointing up at the golden burst of energy up in the sky. The Genesis molecules, we'll now call it. We arrive at the top of page 17, and there's a Superman head insert as he narrates. Absorber, Genesis molecule, whatever. That thing is going to reproduce by fission any moment, and this whole universe will blow up. I have to get you out of here and move this thing to an uninhabited world. It may be the basis of a new form of life based on electrical rather than chemical energy. Besides, it's causing havoc on Earth, expelling wild charges of electrical energy. And what we see over these panels is, panel two is a weird sort of series of humanoid figures, sort of silhouettes made up of almost electrical energy. 
And panel three, we're back to that slightly grumpy policeman who's looking at all the, the motor vehicles that won't move. Panel four is again the Atom looking up at Superman and saying, You want to move that thing and let it absorb everything in this subatomic universe? And Soup's, to my ears, very, very surprisingly says, Yeah, got any better ideas? And with that, the Atom turns and points at Dav Skev and his pals, who are walking towards them and says, Well, what do we do about them? And the first panel of page 18, Superman says, People? I didn't dream this universe was populated. And Dav Skev and his pals are all almost looks like they're worshipping Superman. They're raising their arms and bowing, and Dav Skev says, Hail the holy travellers, our deliverers! The Atom says, Superstitious people, but people nonetheless of a strange, young, promising world. A world like our own in many ways, yet very different. The Genesis molecule seems to be growing larger in the sky. It's overhead and it's bursting, glowing. The Atom points up at it and says, But that thing still has to grow before it produces life, and grow at the expense of all these lives already here. You know what we have to do, Superman. And Superman does look very thoughtful. A caption reads, And for a brief moment, a man of great power thinks of a time past, and a pledge Superboy took with the responsibility for that power. Yeah, it's a shot of Superman with a little thought bubble which shows a younger version of himself obviously looking down in Smallville, I think, by the looks of things. Bear with us for the next few pages, listeners, as I do my best (laughs) to describe what's going on. Top of page 19, caption continues the pledge of a superman and basically superman narrates the next two pages so what we're going to do is i will do the narration of superman's pledge and then i will describe all the events that this narration flows over so i will use this power for all the good that can be done to work for peace to encourage virtue and above all to preserve life in all its forms or failing in this to give up this power forever the first couple of panels of page 19, it looks as though Soup's and the Atom are trying to stop the absorber from absorbing, basically. They're trying to stop the platelets, as I refer to them, from, from being drawn towards it. Soup's is sort of flying around, almost trying to create a, kind of a counter pull so that the, the little orbs, the little platelets won't be absorbed. It's not very clear. There's not really any text to describe. And page 20, we can see the Atom again having breathing problems. And Soup's notices this and flies down and catches them before the, the Atom is injured and then Soups flies the atom back to the little cluster where Dav Skim and his pals live. So in the first panel of page 21, Superman is holding the atom in his hand. And the atom says, Can't live out there. Messed up atmosphere. I know. But I figured out the nature of the molecule's attraction. Caption for panel 2, page 21. Diving into the mantle of the subatomic world, Superman finds a certain type of metal from which he fashions two tiny bracelets for the atom's wrists. Yes. Horrible narrative leap there. Superman, we see him digging out rock and carving almost a you know, chasm into the ground and mm-hmm. then re-emerging. Flies towards the atom saying, that you should set up a magnetic field around your body. Ah, uh, thanks. Says the atom. In an insert panel, we see Superman attaching the bracelets to the atom's tiny wrists. Indeed. And in panel four of page 21, we see Superman and the atom looking up into the sky and it appears that the absorber, the Genesis molecule, it's about to start dividing because it's already split in two, but the aura still surrounds it all, so it maybe hasn't happened completely. It's, you know, obviously, it's full split, it's full development is imminent. Superman says, The molecule is about to split into two. The only way to destroy it now is to hit the two nuclei with our force at the exact moment of fission. He looks down at the atom and final panel and says, You game, Adam? Yeah, I'm okay now. We turn a page. Pass a half-page advertisement for issue one of the Demon, which went on sale on 22nd of June, Jack Kirby's Demon. When was, when's he going to pop up in the podcast? <sighs> Crisis of Infinite Earths, probably. That Possibly. bit with Amethyst and Doctor Fate. Right, mm. panel one of page 22. The Atom leaps in the air. Superman says, All right, it's going to split. Then he cries, Now! And there's a massive burst from the two halves of the, the Absorber. Superman flies into one half and the Atom flies into the other. Ray obviously using his his weight belt, I would presume. The caption for panel three. The titanic forces on a single molecule of both super strength and 180 pounds of a man's weight. And... Yeah, it almost looks here as if they're being hurled backwards. There's little bursts of other golden energy all around them. And then they're flying back through the, the platelet stream, as it were, of the telephone line. Superman is flying along, almost with the atom in his wake, and the atom is thinking... Home free. The explosion of the molecule hurled us back into the telephone's electron flow. 
an out Clark Kent's telephone receiver. Yep, that's it. The final panel of page 23, we see them both emerging from the phone receiver. And Superman says, Adam, you want to enlarge yourself so you can shine a Kandorian enlarging ray on me? Sure. No sooner said than done. In the first panel of page 23, we see the Atom growing back up to full size and restored to being regular Ray Palmer. Small Superman hovers above him, saying, I saw that subatomic world as we left. The people survived the explosion, but the civilization was practically decimated. With that, Ray switches on the Kandor device, catching Superman in the beam and saying, Well, at least it's good the people made it. Superman returns to normal size, saying, That's easy for you to say, Ray Palmer, with your mathematical scientist mentality. And we see Supes putting on Clark Kent's civilian clothes in the next panel as he continues. But I have to make life and death decisions every day. And who's to say whether we're right or wrong? It's not just a matter of destroying one thing so that many may survive. It's complicated. and Very often, it hurts. It looks very pained. And Ray Palmer actually now seems to have done it to Peter Parker. He does, yeah. Which is odd. Clark puts a hand on Ray's shoulder saying, I'm sorry, Ray. I shouldn't get this way. If you want a place to sack out, you're welcome to stay here. I was due at my office half an hour ago. And we can see that Clark's music is still playing in the background. Ray says, Sure. Thanks, Clark. And he thinks, I always thought Superguy was just a muscle-bound enforcer of his definition of justice. Never knew he was so sensitive. I respect him a lot more now. Onto the final page now. As the music still plays, Ray says, Say, what is that infernal racket? For your information, that infernal racket is a very sophisticated form of otherworldly music. So soothing, I didn't even notice I'd left it on. And Ray rubs his head, looking pained, and says, Personally, I'd rather hear the busy signal of a phone any day. Clark replies in the next panel, Any real artist would call you a peasant. And he's interrupted by the ring of his doorbell. He uses his x-ray vision to look through the, the door. He sees a mustachioed gentleman with grown in brown hair, wearing a large red cravat over a yellow shirt. And Clark says, that's Jangles Jones, the rock drummer. You wait till he hears it. And he opens the door for the final panel. And Jangles Jones, who I think has to be based on Mingo Star or someone or nothing, says, Hi, Kent. Sorry to bother you, but I was up practicing all night. And, well, could you please turn down that sound effects record a little? <laughs> and the Atom, Ray Palmer, cracks up with laughter in the background. Clark looks appalled and a small caption tells us that this is... The End. end. And the page is rounded out by an advertisement for, well, a different comic mag is coming. Swamp Thing by Joe Orlando, Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson. Gosh. That's a, that's a time stamp. What an era. Yeah. The Demon coming, Swamp Thing coming. Yep. Big changes at DC. Absolutely. I think oh, by this point, All-Star Western has metamorphosized into Weird Western because of Jonah Hex arriving. Mm -hmm. All that that's going on. So that was World's Finest 213. Thoughts? That was great. Yeah. It was a, a bit messy storytelling and the whole double molecule situation breaking up to destroy a civilization. Superman seemed a bit righteous in it. So I don't really get Ray's adulation of him at the end. I know. You know what? I do. I get it completely because Superman know. is obviously concerned that it's one of these situations where they can't really win. This thing is going to, all mm. they can do is try and minimize the damage, mitigate the damage. And, they're trying to get home at the same time it's almost wiping out this civilization of other people who have to live in this other universe. Given that you were so arsy the other week about Supergirl leaving behind that those <laughs> men who were all enslaved, true, I true, thought you'd be okay. a little bit more sympathetic towards towards these aliens who, whose okay. civilization was wiped out okay. in the process of Superman and the Atom trying to stop them from being destroyed completely. Maybe it's the fact they were being so Zack Snyder hero worshipy when Superman turned up that maybe put me <laughs> off. Because they were very, ah, oh, it was literally the reaching up to, yes. to touch the edge of the cape of Superman. I wonder almost. if Snyder read World's Finest 213 in his preparation. I think um, that's the entire basis of the Snyderverse, yes. Mm. Mm hmm. No, I, I really enjoyed it. I always like it when the Atom turns up. I think the Atom's got one of the best costumes of any superhero. Yes. I'll be honest, it's, it's like top five, definitely. I really like yeah. the Atom. I remember mm -hmm. a very very early age having a very early issue of DC Comics Presents mm -hmm. that has Superman and the Atom in it. Is that the Teen Alien one? Yeah, I remember yeah. having that as a little boy. Into issue 15, I think? Something like that, yeah. yeah. In a way, it kind of echoes that. It's an interesting one, I think, because it highlights that it's not all black and white for Superman. You know, yeah. he, he has a sort of rule that he tries to live up to but sometimes mm -hmm. it's difficult for him to mm -hmm. to follow that through and to mm -hmm. to do it all and sometimes you're not going to win in a wholly satisfactory way that yeah. that means everyone gets out okay mm -hmm. 
It's interesting that they used the Kandorian shrinking ray without even giving an explanation as to what it was. It's obviously changing storytelling in the Silver Age. There'd be masses of capturing about yes, that. Yes, yeah. If this had been a, a Gardner Fox story, then yeah, that's we'd have a massive chunk of text telling you all about this. Uh-huh. And we'd have a scene inside the fortress. He'd probably yeah. be shrunk down in the fortress and then flown out from there. Yeah, but Elliot obviously yeah. credits the, the audience with the intelligence mm-hmm. required so that they, they know what's going on. Mm-hmm. I did love the cameo of Dylan and Giella in it. That was a lot of yes. fun. Great stuff. And I think that the cop is based on Julie Schwartz. Yes, he does look like him, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a nice little reference for everyone involved. It's weird that we didn't see another shot of the cop and, and long hair and Donna kind of and everything returning back to normal. Yeah, I'm thinking long hair might actually be Elliot Magan. It's possible. <laughs> and I think Donna's just stunned at the fact Superman's there. <laughs> From the looks of things, she's because she's staring at him in that panel yeah. on page seven. Yeah, I suppose that's actually that's that's probably fair. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, that's not really clear from from the, i probably didn't make that clear in the telling to be honest i don't think it's that hugely clear in the storytelling yeah. i'm just guessing that's, 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 that's what it is. i think you're right mm-hmm. she's gazing at, the, at this this big hunky kryptonian beefcake at certain points it's kind of hard to really interpret what's going on i mean it's very yeah. visual it rockets along that's the <laughs> fastest it records we've had on, on on a story that's as many pages as this true very visual and not a lot of captioning to mm-hmm. sort of to slow it down mm-hmm. as you said if even a few years ago if this has been a garden fox story we would have had really dense captioning yeah. tell us everything's going on and their dialogue would have, would have reiterated it. But it flows very well, like the like the, the current through the, the telephone wire. I'm <laughs> fascinated with this whole idea of world within the telephone wire. It's bizarre. Was it just created when Ray made that call? How long was it there? How you know, Is time on a different sort of scale in there than it is to the, the real world, as it were? That kind of seems to happen quite a bit with these micro-universities because that was a recurring thing in the Atom series is occasionally he would come across this universe as he shrinks down he he discovers another plane of existence and there's like all these micro people there's a really good story actually in Justice League of America in the early 200s ish I think another one you mean the micro cosmos it's like about a three or four part I think yeah and that's really good Uh and explores a bit of that because the league actually goes to this thing and they when they come out of it they realise that no time has passed for them, but they spent ages in there. So, like Narnia, that civilization that they encountered there has probably been destroyed by the time they actually come back out mm-hmm. because time moves so fast yeah. comparatively there. Yeah, but that's good. We'll look at that story, I suppose, when we get there and decide if we're going to do mm. it or not. But I suppose yeah. by doing this representative example mm-hmm. of the atom finding a micro universe, then you know we've we've kind of touched on that yeah. that aspect of the of the multiverse, as it were. Mm-hmm. The cover's a bit of an extrapolation, isn't it? Yes. But it's very yes. dynamic, and I do like it. It's it very strong. Is. Do you think Clark Kent is going to get his deposit back from his landlord? Of course he will. <laughs> he wrecks the wall. I know. He yeah, he apart the radiator. It. I love how he manages to repair things with his uh, you know, super friction of a super hand, supervision, whatever. Yeah. But it always goes back exactly as it looked originally. That's that's hilarious. It's almost like he's got Firestorm's powers. Mm. But uh, Firestorm doesn't exist yet, but his powers. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I mean, this is around about the time that his powers were kind of dimmed down again. Very true, actually, yeah. So it's interesting uh-huh. that he's still, you know, mm-hmm. appearing in another comic across town and having, you know, still the same level of powers that he did before. Mm-hmm. I'm just really struck by the, you know... The people survived the explosion, but the civilization was practically decimated. I mean, the people yeah. survived, so it wasn't a complete. Yeah, you mm. know, they they will hopefully rebuild, and I kind of feel that it's a quite a bittersweet sort of story compared to a lot we're used to used to at this point. It's yeah. it's quite mature in that way of showing you mm-hmm. an ending which isn't wholly satisfactory for the heroes involved. Yeah, yeah, I think it's one of the reasons why I wasn't too keen in it, as it were, mm. because I prefer to have a satisfactory ending. Real life's not like that, though, is it? That's what that's what the, well. the kids are being taught by that lesson. That's why I love the escapism of comics. But yes. never mind, that's fine. I suppose. I mean, this is, you know, when, when things start to get grim and gritty and realistic, this, this is what happened. But no, it was, it was a lot of fun. Dick Dillon's artwork is excellent. I've managed to scrounge up a few pages of the original art off the interwebs to, to oh, hold nice. on to our socials. So keep your eyes open for those listeners. They'll be up in the next few days at some point. Indeed. And where are our socials, David? Well, on Instagram and Facebook, we're the Earth 2 Podcast. On Twitter, we're podcast underscore Earth 2. It's number two for all our socials. Sadly, there's no letter column for this issue. However, if you want to write to us and tell us what you think about this, we're at the F2 podcast at gmail.com. Also, you can send us a voicemail. If you go to speakpipe.com forward slash the Earth 2 podcast, then you can let us know vocally what you think. You can send us a telephonic message. Yes, indeed. How appropriate, <laughs> given the nature of the story. 
Mm. I've always loved that telephonic speed thing with the yeah. with Ray teleporting through phone lines. Oh, it's it. teleporting. It's fantastic. Of course, that's how he makes his entrance in the next JLA JC team up story. Which Gosh, I'm spoilers! Looking forward to it. It's, yeah. it's approaching us very, very quickly. Mm. We're building towards that one, preparing for it. No, it's it's an interesting story. It felt very modern and very you know. I can imagine it being an episode of a TV show, or mm-hmm. you know, could, you could even get a decent sort of movie out of it in a way. It was yeah, very speedy, very visual, and it's interesting. I think we're both sort of. Our initial reactions are quite different. That's that's yeah. unusual. Interesting. Sometimes we don't agree. Mostly agree. It's not like we did violence <laughs> again, but it's, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, that little mission statement speech that you had over a couple of pages. You yeah. Know, it's, uh-huh. it's that never-ending battle, which he mm. knows that you know he'll never be able to save everyone, but he, he can yeah. he can at least well try. And you know, if that's not inspirational, I don't know what is. I enjoyed the reference to him as Superboy. Unusual. Yeah, in that you know he's decided that as a boy that this is what he's going to do Absolutely. with his life. So, yeah. Absolutely. Great stuff. Yeah. On that note, I've been Peter. I've been David. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again very soon on the Earth Earth 2 Podcast. Podcast. Transmatter Cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime.